Hello and welcome, uh, Foreign Tanglements viewers. Uh, I'm Rob Farley, uh, and I'm at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Uh, today with me is Colin Snyder. Um, how are you doing this morning, Colin? Doing well. How about you? You're well? I'm fine, yes. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. Um, could you introduce yourself to the, to the people? Uh, yes, I'm Colin Snyder. I'm the historian in the Department of History and Latin American History at the University of Texas in Tyler, Texas, which is about two hours east of Dallas. I always get asked, where's Tyler? And that's where it is. Right, it's one of those, uh, uh, I don't know, tremendous numbers of small places in Texas that almost no one knows about but that sort of come through in fun movies sometimes, it seems like. But, yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as fun as it might be to talk about Texas today, instead we are going to talk about... Um, we're going to talk about a uh, little bit about Latin American politics, um, mainly in context of um, the death yesterday of uh, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Um, and so, um, what we're interested in talking when we're going to talk about the Falklands War a little bit um, and sort of Thatcher and how of how the Falklands War I think was understood in Latin America um, and also Argentine politics. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, sort of uh, uh, military politics in Latin America and talk uh, perhaps a little bit about the uh, the new pope um, and then uh, a little bit about directions of the new left. I mean, it's really been a pretty exciting couple months in Latin American politics or the study of Latin American politics, it um, oh, yeah. seems to me. And so, so I guess, um, I mean, starting off with um, what kind of memories of, I mean, everybody is memorializing Margaret Thatcher in their own way. What kind of memories of Maggie Thatcher are going to come out of Latin America? I mean, sort of specifically in Argentina, but also in, in other places. Well, I guess in Argentina, is, yeah, I mean, Argentina would be the most obvious example with, the, the, I'll call it the Malvinas War for sh shorthand, but obviously that's the Falklands as well. Um, really sort of the fact that the war was a key moment in the the end of the military dictatorship, that it's sort of the final, the, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, that mm -hmm. of course you had a military regime, that the military had popped in and out of politics in Argentina, well, through, really since independence, but uh, through, since the 50s onward after the overthrow of Perón. And in 76, they reassert their power and maintain it for it's about seven years in dictatorship. It's notoriously repressive. It kills roughly 30,000 people, depending on the, the statistics that you look at. Um, tortures tens of thousands more. And it's just one of the more extreme examples of repression, not just in terms of the quantity, but in terms of the fashion, that you have people being torn off the streets in broad daylight. Uh, and, and the public is basically unable to act because, well, not unable to act, that you have opposition groups, but that saying, you know, sort of calling the officials on their word gets you thrown in the van as well, and you're going to be one of those disappeared. So it's certainly, um, it had already been facing some major troubles on its own, that you have the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, the mothers of the Plaza of Mayo, who are mothers of children who've gone disappeared, or gone disappearing, um, during the dictatorship had been basically arrested, and then there's no evidence of their whereabouts, and we now know that they were tortured and then drugged and then killed, oftentimes dumped into the Atlantic or the Rio de la Plata from airplanes so that you could destroy evidence of the bodies. So that you already had groups like them starting to gain credence um, and attention globally, and then the economy starts to worsen by the early 80s, that there's, there's a devaluation of the peso, that they try to impose some shock neoliberal economic policies, um, but end up with higher inflation. Mm -hmm. So already by 81, support for the regime is really flagging amongst a lot of people. And, and Galtieri then, who comes into office, basically decides that the Falklands will be a useful way to drum up nationalism and erase all those other criticisms and problems. And he's right in the short term that it does really lead to this, that you even have the unions that the dictatorship has spent years cracking down on suddenly showing this sort of superficial outpouring of support for the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the superficial, not in the sense that they're not sincere, but in the sense that um, it's not going to be real deep support for the dictatorship, but that they support this and the military mistakenly believes both that the United States will quickly ally with it and that Thatcher won't act, but she's, of course, in her own economic troubles and record low unpopular or low ratings in her polls. So she uses it to do the same function, right? So she sort of have dueling nationalisms here, and of course Argentina will be handily defeated by the British in the war. Right. And that, then that sort of support for the um, military arose just as quickly, and within a year, by the end of 83, they're out of office. Um, right. And in, in now, you know, economics and whatnot. Go ahead. Now, well, there's a, I mean, there's a sort of a fascinating mirror imaging here, um, or a mirror imaging that didn't happen um, in terms of the way that the 
um, the way that the uh, the way that Galtieri and the, the Junta seem to be have been thinking about um, popularity in war, right? That mm-hmm. uh, and I you know I read one of the obits yesterday. I can't remember where it was in the Guardian or somewhere elsewhere. I mean, so Galtieri and Haig were the only ones who didn't think that Thatcher was going to fight this war. Right, that it was it was so obvious to everyone in the United Kingdom that she was going to fight this war, that this war was was entirely in her interest to fight. Um, right. That it, it should have been just just shocking, or it should not have been shocking. Right. I mean, there there should the Ar- the Argentines should have fully understood. Um, you know, and I guess you know, support of the United States is a different thing, is a different question. Right. It, you know, especially mm-hmm. there's a good relationship between the Argentine regime um, and the United States at the time. Um, but you know, it seems really to be misreading the international system to suggest that the United States was going to go against um, a NATO ally um, in terms of an attack, a direct attack on that, that ally's territory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, but I think too, I mean, what I've read, and um, not so much from the British perspective, but that the Reagan administration was kind of on the fence. They were hoping something mm-hmm. could be worked out, and I suppose at one point even they had recommended... Um, a three-way partitioning of the Falklands, not partitioning, but a three-way governance between mm-hmm. Britain, the Argentines, and the United States, while they then went back, because the other issue was that they, there was supposed to be, there had been an earlier treaty in which England and United and the Argentines would sit down and try to negotiate the issue of the Malvinas Falklands, mm-hmm. and Argentina had kept waiting for for England to fulfill that, that um, their end of the discussion, their dialogue, and England had just simply been completely unwilling to go to the table over anything. So I get the sense, even I mean, and again, I'm not. The, I don't really look at the U.S. side of this as much, but I, I got the sense that even the Reagan administration was, at, le- at least in the Nate figure of Haig, who was sort of the point man on this in the, at the beginning, were really kind of hoping for some sort of peaceful resolution, uh, perhaps through joint governance. Right, right, right. Now that you had, um, I mean, you also had, I mean, you had direct support for the regime on the part of Kirkpatrick, I think, and so you certainly had Absolutely. voices. You, you had voices in the in the um, United States that were certainly pro Argentine. Um, yes. It's just that those voices, you know, even if the, had the, if those voices had carried the day, we would not have had. Any, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine you would have had even a, sort of a Suez level of um, of um, sort of reduction in support for the for the the British effort. Um, mm-hmm. It seems like so. I mean, I guess. Uh, I, I'm kind of curious about this this question of um, shared governance and question of, of sort of how the situation is being, being negotiated out, um, because it seems that I guess okay. So starting off from from a just war point of view, from a legal war point of view, um, you know the the great great term about just war theory is that just war theory is perfect because it's never failed to justify a war. Um, and so you can always have lawyers and you can always have theorists who are going to explain um, sort of why a state needed to go to war. And in the Argentine case, you really have to do some twisting, but you finally in the end can come to you know, a certain set of arguments about um, sort of historical presence in the Malvinas and so forth. Um, but for the British, it's really a no-brainer, right? It's, 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 it's a straightforwardly just war, uh, you know, an attack on sovereign territory with people mm-hmm. who live there who are completely enthusiastic about being British. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, no question that it's a just war. Um, but a lot of the criticism of Thatcher seems to rely on that she did not, that instead of, re- you know, relying on the potential for a negotiated settlement, um, Instead, she decided to to respond to the military attack with military means. Um, now, I mean, is your sense? I mean, I guess from what you know, was there a potential for a negotiated settlement? I mean, it seems like certainly ceasefires were floated here and there, um, but they really did. Nothing came before the sinking of the Belgrano, and then um, you know things escalated from there. Um, you know, was this shared governance a possibility? I, I don't know if it was. I don't know how it could be because I, the, the thing I've always read about Argentine military demands has been that they were they were such that England never would have agreed to them, or at least you know any pseudo nationalist even in England would agree to them. That it was eventually ses- complete and total cessation of the territories back to the Argentines, mm-hmm. uh, and of course that's the one condition that's absolutely off the table for the British. Um, I right. do believe that at towards I, I don't remember the exact details off the top of my head now, but towards the end I don't remember if this comes before or after the Belgrano. But that the Argentines had actually, um, that England had, the United States had sort of were offered an, a solution in which they could sit down and negotiate but wouldn't automatically get the territory back. But at that point, it wasn't one that was feasible. It was, it was an out for the military in Argentina. 
Mm -hmm. But it wasn't feasible because they were sort of trapped by the very nationalism they'd created, that they sort of said, we're going to get the islands back, we're going to invade, there's no way England will attack. England does, and then they're given this position, well, you're not going to get them back yet, so are you willing to do this? And they can't really go before their people and say, well, we're going to work on a negotiated settlement now and not get the islands back immediately. Uh, and, and there's a very big pushback against that, you, you know, even though they sort right. of float the idea in the amongst the Argentine population, because the only way the support for the regime had ever appeared was because it was, we're getting the islands back after, you know, at this point, 150 years almost. Uh, right. And then to come back and say, well, maybe not, uh, sorry, you know, that's not going to really help your nationalist project. Right, right. When the whole when the whole construction is built around that, I mean, the the the, the war again seems to be, you know, it seems to be built around, you know, the 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 argument for success of the war seems to be built around two points. You know, it's one, um, the the British won't come and fight for them, and two, and this is sort of a you know a second thought. Even if the British come and fight for them, we can win, right? Um, and we should forget. I mean, and, and the British come back and sort of think about this. You know, it was, and I think. Whatever it was a near run thing, right? That that there are ways that the war could have played out where the Argentines, where you know, different attacks if their exocets had been more effective, if their bombs had been more effective, um, the British really could have lost this war, um, which presumably would have, um, you know, the the prospect not only of seizing the Malvinas and controlling the Malvinas, but also of having defeated and maybe sunk an aircraft carrier or something like that. Um, you can see how well that would have played with uh, with uh, the military regime, right? I mean, that would have been fantastically um, oh, sort of yeah. uh, popular nationalist to have the, the wreckage of a, of, a, of a British aircraft carrier to uh, to uh, boost the regime. Um, but that once once the British establish that yes, they will fight, then it becomes at least potentially a negotiable solution. But um, you know, once the British establish they'll fight, the British have no longer have an interest in negotiating. Um, and so that seems to be some of the confusion. So I'm kind of curious, I mean, given the role that the war played in the end of military rule in Argentina, um, you know, does that, does that affect the historical memory of the war in Argentina and Latin America, I mean, is there, you know, is there this conversation that, uh, you know, bless Maggie was terrible. Yes, the war was unjust and so forth, but at least it got rid of the of the military regime. I mean, is there is there is there a complexity to memory of the war in, oh, well, in Latin America actually, and Argentina specifically? It's really curious, actually. Um, the the way this sort of post dictatorship memory narrative has uh, worked out has been far more bound in the question of prosecution, I would say, than of the actual war itself. The prosecution of those who were responsible. In part, I think, I mean, the war is absolutely a piece of the democratization process. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can say that it's the own, it's the catalyst, right. nor is it the final one. Because yes, it hurts. Well, you can't say it's perhaps one of the final pieces to be added to mm -hmm. the puzzle. But even then, inflation will hit 100 percent by the early, by early '83, and that's really it. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of memory, it's it's a uh, you don't get the sense it's re they really want to talk about it because it's it's sort of a sense of I want to say kind of almost a dual shame both that the Malvinas still don't belong to Argentina I mean this is an issue that Kirchner even today is still sort of I don't want to say rattling sabers about but you know the rhetoric has gotten a little elevated recently um, mm -hmm. certainly with the addition of the Pope and we can talk about him later an Argentine Pope and the question of the Malvinas you know that's up for debate as well but also the fact that was sort of this devastating loss at a time where they were already kind of suffering and and I would even suggest that possibly you know Finally, remembering the war would work because so many people were, so, you know, in some regards, it's almost like, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the recent infighting amongst some liberals on the, the internet over, well, I was for Iraq, but then I realized it was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. right. That you're kind of, you had kind of have a similar thing where people are kind of, there's almost a shame to say, well, I really supported the war and the dictatorship because I got swept up in this nationalist fervor without stopping to think this is still a regime that's killed 30,000 people. Um, right. So, so the memory is really understated. They, there's a in, in Buenos Aires when I was there. You, there's a um, there's a memorial to the Malvinas Falklands War, the Malvinas, and all it really is is sort of a flag, and you know a little bronze statue of the two island, two main islands, and a list of the names of those who died during it. Mm -hmm. And there's not much more about that because you can't really tap into this nationalist cause in the post dictatorship period because it was inherently a dictatorship version of nationalism. And even amongst the troops, it's a bit complicated because it, it became apparent after the fact that the dictatorship itself was actually torturing and murdering its own soldiers in the course of right. the war. 
And, and so the way that this sort of works out in public memory, I saw two good quotes yesterday. I'm paraphrasing both here. But one soldier was sort of, I'm glad she's dead, you know, that she really hurt this country, but this country was kind of a mess to begin with. But the other one that says, you know, that's not really our concern. It's, you know, I don't wish her ill or good. It's just, you know, we're, we're focusing on trying to get our pensions now because you have soldiers who are in the right. military who didn't necessarily fight on the islands themselves but who were in, deployed at bases throughout the country who don't get um, – don't get pensions and sort of service and credit for their service during wartime. So that the way, it, if it comes up in the public, it's a piece of this bigger picture of democratization and even amongst those who really focus on it, it's more about I need to get my rewards for the services I provided a brutal state. Um, but it's not really, I'm re I, I've never gotten a sense, you know, I saw yesterday Morrissey typically shooting his mouth off in a very Anglophilic style saying that Argentines must be dancing in the streets and I've never ever gotten that sense from Argentina either when I was there right. having read on it or even in the news from Argentina yesterday. It was more about, well, this, you know, she, she, has a, she has a role in this play. Right. Now, I mean, uh, you know, that's, it's, it, that's a, sort of a really interesting memory because the, I mean, like, maybe just one or, I guess, last, uh, last blogging hands, I, I talked with Michael Cohen about sort of our historical memory in the United States of the Iraq War and the decision and the run-up to the Iraq War. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, it's very interesting to me um, the you know, sort of explaining way retrospective support for a, or retrospectively explaining away support for a failed war, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are a whole bunch of strategies that are employed in the United States for how people, really on the left and on the right, right? Because leftists have to, you know, those not really necessarily leftists. We should actually, you know, acknowledge that by and large, with regards to the Iraq War, leftists were 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 good. Sort of liberals were were much more problematic, and so liberals trying to explain why they thought the Iraq War was a fantastic idea. Um, yeah. And so it's really kind of interesting in the Argentine context to see, um, you know, oh, well, you know, the war was great, but the, the um, I mean, is there, and, and so parts of it are the prosecution, and so is there this, um, I mean, it sounded from what you said that there's this, um, what we call in the American context, the incompetence dodge, that it was, um, it was a great idea, but the people who conducted it were so incompetent that it ended up being stupid. Um, and you know that may actually be true in the context of the Argentine War, but I mean, is that does something like the incompetence dodge play out in, in sort of in parts of the the historical memory for the Argentines? No, I'd say it's even more just pure silence and forgetting. And I think that sort of right. that that memorial downtown kind of reflects that it's completely stripped of any politicization. That it's a war that happened. It's not even sort of the ar you know sometimes it's the army started this war, and you'll have opponents. So that one of, one of the ways you can both tell that it was not necessarily it was quickly a bad idea historically, but also had quick support is that the mothers of the Plaza of Mayo are, have always trumpeted amongst their various accomplishments that we were one of the few who spoke out against the war, uh, mm -hmm. which indicates that even union leaders and others who would tri typically be critical were not. Um, but yeah, I get the sense it's not even so much, oh, well, they just didn't know what they were doing. It was really an incompetent, or not an incompetence, but it's almost a silence, right? That the, the emphasis mm -hmm. really does then fall back on social mobilization, on the economic scenario that... I mean, I don't think it's any secret that certainly, you know, I think the 2006 um, midterm elections and even 2008 elections in the United States can kind of point to this. Right, right. That nationalist causes overseas are real fun, even if it's relatively close overseas in the case of the Malvinas Falklands. But if the economy is terrible, you're not worried about your nation as much. Um, and really, that was the sense in the 80s. So I think that's part of the reason why the nationalism was so sudden to appear but so quick to disappear. It, that it didn't even, I don't think it really, and the war was so brief, it didn't really have time to sink in. Right. Uh, to a deeper level, so that when that post-dictatorship narrative is created um, and, and sort of the public memory goes on, and you have so quickly that the, the military falls out, but they're still present. So how do you go about prosecuting these crimes and everything, that it really does sort of shift from the war and the disaster or incompetence of the war and trying to explain that away to just this was everyone acknowledging this was a horrible dictatorship and we need to find justice and move on. And it, it right. basically leads to almost... Um, not quite a total silencing of the war in the narrative, but at least a greatly diminished um, consideration of popular and social uh, actions and attitudes during the war itself. Right. So, um, I mean, I should also acknowledge before we go that, that, and this is, so, the Falklands War in terms of political science, and you're a historian, I'm sure you have contempt for political scientists, but um, in uh, context of political science, the war, and Dan Dresner wrote a good post about this yesterday, the war is important from for from the point of view of diversionary war theory for the reasons you've already discussed, um, which is that, I mean, it seems to be a great example of a war that, that countries are fighting in order to restore domestic popularity. Um, but the war is also interesting from my point of view because it's one of those 
There are relatively few cases of this, but they exist, and they should never exist, which is cases in which non-nuclear states launch wars against nuclear states, um, which I find really, I mean, the other sort of really big example is the Yom Kippur War, um, where, where you know, non-nuclear states are just are completely undeterred by nuclear weapons. Um, and so, you know, and that, that those kinds of wars then play into broader conversations about, well, the North Korean nuclear program or the Iranian nuclear program and so forth, um, which become interesting from a theoretical point of view. Now, I think this will actually be a good transition to the next point. So Thatcher, you know, her relevance to Latin America was not simply this question of fighting Argentina, right? I mean, she was also very close. Um, and I believe she even said a whole variety of nice things um, on, on the death of uh, Augusto Pinochet, right? Um, yes, yes. I mean, is, so I guess, I mean, is there uh, sort of taking it out of just the Argentine con context, um, is there any complication at all to memory of Maggie Thatcher in Latin America, or is she understood sort of just as, you know, the supporter of horrific military regimes? And no, understanding no. the Pinochet regime is itself sort of a historically complicated memory in Chile and other places, but... Right. Yeah, I mean, she is pretty closely tied to Chile, uh, especially, I mean, that she's, she's one of the first countries to start selling arms to Chile again in 1980, that England and, and Pinochet get arms deals set up. Uh, because under Carter, certainly he'd sort of marginalized that effort uh, because of human rights allegations and, and things like the Church Commission and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And in return, I mean, Chile and Argentina have nearly gone to war with one another at this point over some islands in the, you know, in the Beagle Channel um, right. for question, uh, questions, basically. I mean, they're, they're really cold rocks. So I, I suppose it's for maritime boundaries. Right. But right. The, the, in that process th that... Um, that's part of the reason why Argentina is also kind of hoping to get the Falklands, is it sort of gets them away from the Beagle War and these conflicts with Chile that nearly lead to warfare. And so that she, and when that happens, then um, you get this really strange geopolitical alignment in Latin America because you have all these theoretically right-wing authoritarian governments in places like Brazil, Chile, Argentina, it's still Paraguay, Uruguay, um, mm -hmm. and what you end up with Chile and and. England sort of working together that Chile supports England in the Malvinas War and not Ar Argentina. And Argentina shut out from both England and the United States and is trying to say, oh, look, we're a big world, first world player. And it's rejected by these two countries. So it ends up having to turn to the Soviet Union for weapons um, and Cuba. So that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of groups that had forsworn, you know, that it wasn't a part of it turns to for weaponry, but it's also these groups that are supposed to represent the left. We'll have this right wing dictatorship. Right. And even Brazil gets drawn into the fray because. The Soviet weapons end up passing through Brazil, which is still under a right-wing dictatorship for a few more years, um, a democratizing one at that moment that it's already starting to right. open up. But since right. you get this really strange regional geopolitical alignment in which Chile is sort of the outlier aligning itself with the first world, and specifically with that, the so-called first world, right? I mean, the historians at this point, we hate those terms. Um, right, right, right. But that, that they're allied with, China, with um, England, while Brazil and Argentina are sort of working together informally. Um, so it is a sort of dramatic, so she is, like when she died yesterday, at Pinochet's family says, oh, we've lost a very dear friend, um, that she certainly approved of the, the neoliberal policies of Pinochet. And I think she was more, um, I mean, this is pure conjecture, but I, I think that the sort of, the Pinochet regime is more personalist than almost every other one in South America, perhaps save for the Strassner regime in Paraguay. Mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, that allowed for a kind of, strength of action and unilateral decision-making um, that Thatcher really liked and employed herself. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, and, you know, to, to abstract again, away again from this, it is very strange for me to sort of look back at some retrospective, and this sort of is in, I think, mainly in the United Kingdom, right, but you have this, you know, I mean, leftists were never, were never besotted with Thatcher, right? I mean, there was, I mean, they knew Thatcher was the enemy from the start, right, in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, um, uh, and I think in the United States. And so there was, a, you know, it was not difficult to con to to convince them that Thatcher was was problematic. But it was, it, it is interesting to me how um, the Falklands War becomes tied into, um, you know, this version of anti-colonialist rhetoric, such that sort of being on the anti-colonial, anti-imperial side, in this case, meant siding with a vicious, authoritarian, brutal, right-wing military regime from a settler society. Yeah. Um, you know, because on the other side was Maggie Thatcher. Yeah. Um, which is just, which is, is historically, 
you know, fascinating. It's politically fascinating too. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it, and yeah, it and sort of destroys all these stereotypes. What's that? It destroys all these Cold War stereotypes. The left was at the left, the right was at the right, and that's that. Right, 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 exactly. Um, and, I mean, for a while, and I, you know, I think that this is changing, but for a while, sort of, you know, expressing contempt for the decision to go to war in the Falklands was sort of a, 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 a sort of almost a leftist rite of passage in the, in the United Kingdom. And I, I, you know, I think that that is changing, right? And I also think that any, any regime in the United Kingdom would have done the same thing. I don't think you needed Maggie um, to decide to go to war, right? I mean, maybe you needed her to decide to go to war in this particular fashion, but, but that a labor regime, a labor government would have gone to war as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, so anyway, dragging this back then, again, to Latin American politics and military and politics, um, what... I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff here for me, because this war and Maggie are tied up with you know, the direct history of the regimes, the military regimes in Chile and Argentina, also sort of broader arguments about the decline of military regimes in the 1980s. Of course, of course, it's not just in Argentina and Chile that these end, but it's, a, you know, it's across the continent that these, these regimes are ending across the 1980s. Um, what were people like um, the man who had become Pope Francis I? I mean, what were they doing around this time in 1982, sort of as part of the, the broader democratization democratization process in Latin America? Um, I know that's a big question, but I, maybe maybe you can take that and then sort of leap forward from there. Right, well, it depends. Or something. It depends which church you're dealing with. I mean, we'll start with the church since you mentioned Francis. It depends which church you're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. That's certainly, at this point, um, you know, you have your regimes all falling in the 80s to 90. Uh, that, that Brazil's out in 85 through sort of self-guided democratization with, and I want to be clear that the social movements, we'll come back to them perhaps, uh, play a vital role as well. This is not strictly top-down in spite of their best efforts. Argentina's That's out right. in 83. Uruguay's out in 85. Strassner's out in 89. Um, uh, Chile, you know, Pinochet's out in 90, but with having lost the plebiscite in 88. So th there is sort of this phase where, at this point, you're dealing with John Paul II's post-Vatican II sort of undoing of liberation theology, and yet the church, which had traditionally been a very conservative institution, hasn't necessarily abandoned some of these ideas of social justice, particularly with regards to human rights in countries like Chile and in Brazil, whereas the Argentine... Uh, that, Certainly, and I, I've mentioned this before on, on blog posts, that the Brazilian church early on supports the dictatorship, but by the late 60s, they're having secret meetings with the regime where they're, they're worried that it's going to look like legitimation, but they're basically saying, mm -hmm. Cur cool it with the, the human rights abuses. They, Ken Serban has this excellent book, Secret Dialogues, that goes into these secret meetings. But then by the mid-70s, your, your archbishopric of the Catholic Church in Sao Paulo is a key figure in sort of raising the issue of human rights and criticizing it, that Brazil, they currently have a truth commission in Brazil, but really the first publication of torture reports comes from the Catholic Church working with Protestants, um, where they find this brilliant loophole that if, if you're working on a habeas corpus case, you can a lawyer could check out military files for 24 hours and then return them, so they just basically have lawyers on the clock 24 hours a day Xeroxing stuff, and they're compiling mm -hmm. this report. Uh, so the church there plays a very really key role in sort of raising the issue of human rights and ultimately kind of indirectly or directly contributing to the, the um, to the erosion of support for the regime. And in Chile, the, vicari the Catholic vicariate in, in um, Santiago plays a key role in sort of helping the families of the disappeared, trying to track down their loved ones, protecting them, raising the issue of human rights. Whereas in Argentina, they never, the church doesn't, ever, the, at least at the institutional level, doesn't ever really take that role. And that's not to say that not a single Catholic priest or official ever criticized the regime, because that's obviously too broad, right? That's not the case either. <laughs> right, right. But that even the Argentine regime had been so, not only had it been the severest of all in terms of the amount of murders, but also had it, um, the Catholic Church itself had been the, one of the most supportive of the dictatorship. That the big controversy over whether, you know, to what extent was Francis I involved or not, that he had at least met with some people, it, apparently the documentary record that um, Horacio Verbitsky's stuff on this, that he met with officials and had basically said, you're not going to get any major criticisms from us. And yes, that was in 76, and you know, he would be pretty macabre if he had forecast that they were going to you know, have uh, torture on this and repression on this scale. But nonetheless, he gives a sort of blank check, and throughout the regime then, the Catholic Church is remarkably silent. Uh, 
And so even when the democratization process is taking place then, it, the Catholic Church itself as an institution, and again, there are individuals who are exceptions to this, but as an institution, it's not really, um, the population has grown weary of the dictatorship and its abuses, and because you have groups like the Mothers of the Positive Amado or the sort of, um, you know, some labor movements, the, the church is kind of discredited, and there are other groups you can sort of go to that have a history of legitimacy in criticizing the regime. Mm -hmm. So that it, it's not, it's sort of, the church is quiet in terms of not criticizing the regime during it, but then it's quiet in the democratization process where it sort of steps off to the side and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. ducks its head and hopes no one pays attention to it for a bit. And that's really where, though, I think the whole issue of the, the Francis's um, guilt or not comes into play. Like, did he give up those two? Uh, priests, he may or may not have, but even the, the, the debate in the states that I saw when he was elected pope was kind of frustrating because the question isn't, you know, it's this idea of culpability through direct participation, whereas the Argentine Truth Commission, and that was a state truth commission, and they, they, you know, they had their findings in the mid-80s, had said that the church was complicit even through silence, that failing to talk is still complicity, right? And I, I was sort of baffled that in the United States we were not sort of recognizing that silence can be complicity especially because that sort of is the, the issue at play certainly with the Holocaust, right? To what extent did right, the German right. population or the Polish population want to, well, oh, well, I didn't know. Well, you were silent. Um, right. Right. So, so, yeah, so the Catholic Church in Argentina sort of diverges from its neighbors in that regard. Right. Is there, so is there a, um, I mean, is there something beyond a personalistic explanation uh, for why that is? I mean, what's the, I mean, what, what, what is the decision? Um, well, I guess two questions, right? First, what is the decision? Um, or what, what are the reasons for the differences between the Brazilian and the Chilean and the Argentine churches in this? Mm -hmm. That's part. But then my second question would be, and this also, of course, has to do with transnational movements and the Catholic Church, obviously, um, was, you know, what was coming out of the Vatican, to, I mean, to your recollection or to your knowledge, in terms of guidance for these churches that were all sort of, in, or seemed to be in structurally similar positions in Latin America, but they made very much different choices? Uh, regarding the second question first, I mean, the Vatican itself had kind of, it hadn't exactly been a critic of these regimes to begin with, right? That you're still in this Cold War context where communism equals right. godlessness and it's going to lead to all kinds of sexual mores that go counter to the Catholic uh, principles. And so even, for example, when Pinochet takes off, and, you, and this is under Paul VI, so we're not dealing with, I mean, as far as popes go, we're not dealing with a really conservative one here. That his secretary, like sort of the guy running what was effectively the Vatican's secretary of the state, Giovanni, I want to say Bellini, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's referred to as the, the Vatican Kissinger. Uh, and he basically said that, oh, well, there, you know, Pinochet took over, and there may be a couple of isolated cases of bloodshed, but it's, it's being overstated that this is a leftist conspiracy. And this is a guy speaking on behalf of foreign policy for the Catholic Church, for the Vatican. Um, so you, you have high ranking cardinals already, and he's a moderate. Like when, when John Paul. Mm -hmm. When they, when Paul the Sixth died, and then when John Paul the First dies, he's considered a moderate. That they're conservative in the church, not necessarily into the foreign relations, but certainly in terms of um, church doctrine. He's 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 sort of in the middle, and so the, the church had not ever really concerned. And you're dealing with certainly still Italian popes and then a Polish pope. The extent to which they're really involved in Latin America, then that they support, they basically will eventually say, okay, human rights violations are bad, but says so communism. Um, right. And but you know even while John Paul II, with his you know sort of right hand man Ratzinger, the future Benedict XVI, is going after and silencing anyone who's preaching this liberation theology that had um, advocated social justice issues. Basically, that Paul VI had said it's okay to adopt the preferential option for the poor, and, and that sort of breaks with centuries of Catholic ties, the, elite, the institutions ties to the landholding and industrial elites in the region, um, and then so the fact that John Paul II starts to undo a lot of that kind of is a, you know, it's not an explicit su statement of support for these regimes, but it is a very tacit one, right? That this right, sort of preferential right. option for the poor that can be tied to leftism or ditching. 